I'd like to conclude by looking briefly at two Korean people who I think also encapsulate some of the real strengths uh, of Korean society, of modern contemporary Korea. One of them you will know um, and one of them you won't. The first of them is Dr. Chung Yee Sun. I suspect that probably you haven't heard of her. Um, as you can see, she was born uh, in 1956. Uh, she uh, studied very hard at school. She studied very hard at university here in Korea. And she entered the government forensic uh, service. Because of her talents, because of her hard work and dedication, she made good progress within the forensic service. But by the time uh, she reached the early 1990s, I think she felt that there was a sort of glass ceiling, if you like, that was preventing her advance within the organisation as far as really her talents ought to have justified. A glass ceiling that was there for many, many women uh, here in Korea. And so she chose to apply for a British government scholarship scheme, a scheme called, we call the Chevening Scheme. And as a result of that, she was able to spend a couple of years in London in the early 1990s studying, doing postgraduate uh, research uh, in forensic science at King's College uh, in London. And she says that that was the most important thing that she did in her professional life. On her return, the fact that she had studied at a, a really well-known and respected institution uh, opened new doors for her. And eventually, this led to her uh, becoming the first female head of Korea's forensic, National Forensic Service. Uh, a very important, uh, influential role. But she is not just respected in Korea in her professional capacity. She's also recognized internationally as being uh, a real international authority in this area. And as a consequence, uh, earlier this year, uh, for a year, she was president of the International Association of Forensic Sciences, a very eminent position. Um, and she achieved that position because forensic scientists around the world recognized uh, her outstanding qualities. And it was because of the contribution that she has made to bilateral educational and research exchanges between Korea and the United Kingdom over many years uh, and the, uh, the role that she has played internationally in forensic science that earlier this year Her Majesty the Queen uh, agreed to uh, present uh, uh, Dr. Chung Yee Sun with an honorary uh, British award as commander of the British Empire, uh, a very prestigious award in the United Kingdom and I had the great personal pleasure of being able to present that to her at the British Embassy residence here in Korea earlier in the summer. So that's the first example of a really top uh, Korean I think uh, representative of Korean knowledge um, and uh, uh, professional commitment. My second example is uh, somebody who's probably better known to you and that's uh, Chung Kyung Hwa uh, the great Korean virtuoso uh, violinist. As you know, she comes from an astonishingly talented musical family. And in her early years, uh, she, with her brothers and, uh, brother and sisters, went to the United States uh, to study uh, music. And she studied under some great uh, tutors uh, in the United States. She uh, showed great determination and great dedication in uh, her studies. But still, her professional career was perhaps not developing uh, as well as it should have, given the, her great natural talent and her very hard work. Um, and her big breakthrough came uh, in the early 1970s, uh, when she was able to perform with the London Symphony Orchestra, um, perform concerto with them. Uh, and that led to a recording contract with one of the great British uh, recording labels, DECA. And that was a very, very um, productive, creative uh, relationship between um, uh, a very respected recording company and this great creative musical uh, talent, uh, Chung Kyung Hwa. Uh, Chung Kyung Hwa lived, in fact, for several years uh, in the United Kingdom. And we're very, very proud of that association uh, between uh, her uh, and our country. And I'm uh, very, very pleased to say that after uh, several years of uh, injury, uh, Chung Kyung Hwa is now back performing 
and on the 2nd of December this year she will be at the Royal Festival Hall in London giving uh, her first recital in London for many, many years. And that recital on the 2nd of December falls uh, on the eve of the unveiling of a new Korean War Memorial in London by Foreign Minister Yoon byung se on the 3rd of December. So it's a really nice um, encapsulation, I think, of the breadth of the relationship between Korea and the United Kingdom that goes way back to the dark days of the Korean War. Uh, but now we can celebrate it with wonderful cooperation in the arts and, and, and the sciences. So there we have it. I think um, in different ways, Chung Yi Sun and Chung Kyung Hwa really exemplify the contribution of women to contemporary Korean society. I think that they demonstrate very clearly that Korea's mothers and daughters are a huge but underused resource in this country and that uh, for the future, for the future success of Korea, which has made astonishing progress in the last uh, 60 years, but for the future success, it's going to be absolutely essential that Korean, uh, Koreans and Korean society make sure that they are capitalizing and using all of Korea's diverse talents, male or female, um, irrespective of educational or, or social backgrounds. And in the same way, I think that the fantastic innovation of Alan Turing, the amazing creativity of Joanne Rowling, demonstrate why we in the United Kingdom now attach so much importance to celebrating our diversity and nurturing talent, nurturing talented people, irrespective of their background. Thank you very much. And now I think we can take questions, if anyone would like to ask questions. Yes. Okay, first, it's a real honor for me to have a conversation with you, Mr. Whiteman. Uh, uh, you said that creativeness is uh, generated by openness. Is that right? Oh, by awkwardness. O openness. 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 That's right, yes. yeah. And I would like to ask, uh, what do you think can be done to make people open-minded? Um, that's, that's a really profound question. <laughs> it's a very deep and difficult question. Um, I think it's a lot is to do with education. Um, certainly in the United Kingdom, we encourage, from the earliest age, we encourage our young people to ask lots of questions in the classroom, uh, to ask teachers if they're not understanding something, to contribute their own ideas in the classroom. And I think that's one way that through education you can encourage uh, openness. I think modern technology creates a great opportunity as well because with the uh, internet now, with social media, uh, all of us have got very easy access to all sorts of different thoughts and opinions and ideas. And I think it's very important to any, for any organization, whether it's a government organization or whether it's a private business or a, a non-governmental organization, it's very important to draw on these different sources of ideas. Um, and as I said, I think uh, you need as well to uh, be open to different sorts of people. Uh, any society that gets stuck in thinking there's only one model for success, I think is not likely to continue to, de continue to develop. More broad than that, it's just recognizing that anybody uh, could have that great idea uh, and making sure that you are open and ready to give people from any sort of background, uh, how, whoever they are, uh, Give them a hearing, give them an opportunity. Who else would like to ask a question? Hello. Uh, as the ambassador to the Republic of Korea, do you think the Korean society is open-minded or on the progress to be open-minded society? 
I think that Korea is on a, an upward tra trajectory. When I walk around the streets of Seoul now, um, what I observe is a, a, a growing sense of individuality. Um, and, uh, you know, it's very obvious that young people in Korea are very open to the rest of the world, to things that are going on in other parts of the world. Uh, young, more and more Koreans are, are travelling overseas. That's a great way to broaden one's mind. It doesn't matter what age you are. Uh, it's a great way to be introduced to new things, new thinking. Um, and although it's trite, it's a sort of simple example, um, I think that um, uh, Sai and Gangnam style also demonstrate that there's a huge level of innovative, uh, creative uh, power and resource uh, within, uh, within Korean society. You see that as well in Korean cinema, um, in contemporary art uh, here in Korea. There's a lot of creativity. And I think my sense is that this is something that's really uh, developed momentum over the last 10 or 15 years. So I think that's, that's a very positive thing. And great companies like Samsung, they are looking outwards. Samsung Electronics, LG Electronics, they are looking out to the rest of the world. They're looking out to the rest of the world as a market, but they're also looking out to the rest of the world as a source of um, ideas and contributing to their own research and the next generation of innovation. So, I th you know, I think, it's, I think it's developing here. Thank you very much. Who else? Uh, thank you, Ambassador, for your wonderful presentation. I felt it was really great that you stress out the importance of diversity in our society. Uh, while I was listening to your presentation, you also like mentioned that Korea is underusing the you know talent of females, and there is still like a, a sexual sex inequality in our society. Uh, as I'm attending a women's university, and I see many graduates like facing this glass barrier in their work uh, workplace. So what are your suggestions to our Chris Korean society and our Korean people to kind of tackle away this like sexual inequality? Yeah, um, it's, um, you, one only has to look at the composition of uh, senior levels of different sectors of Korean life to recognize that there's a, a historic problem there. I think it's probably changing, but it's probably also not changing as quickly as it needs to. Uh, or as it should. Um, uh, I would say that you know, it's still an issue in the United Kingdom. I'm not present, pretending at all that we don't have an issue with gender uh, equality in the United Kingdom. Uh, the uh, academic studies demonstrate that uh, the earnings of women in the UK uh, are lower. The average earnings of women in the UK are lower than the average earnings of men. And that pay gap, it's important that we, we close that. Uh, in, our, in our companies, in government ministries, there is still a majority of, of, of men in senior positions rather than women. It's changing, but again, it needs to change more quickly. I think what, what's required in Korea and elsewhere is there needs to be a sort of all of society willingness, desire to make the change. Because it's not easy, it's not easy. I mean, there are social structures and expectations that are built up around uh, educating uh, young people, the role of mothers in, uh, in, in education and therefore the amount of time that they're able to develop, devote to their careers. There are issues around the provision of childcare. Um, there are all sorts of different challenges that, that, that need to be addressed to create an environment in which women are able to balance uh, work and family life in a way which suits them. Um, uh, but I think it's important to try and make progress on these issues, particularly in circumstances in Korea where uh, the birth rate is so low, um, there is no doubt that Korea is going to have to look to women in the future, uh, more women uh, playing a bigger role in the workforce. And so it's, you know, now is the moment to begin to uh, confront some of the challenges in creating that enabling environment, I think. Anyone else? Uh, 
um, Mr. Ambassador, it was uh, great to see your presentation. And along with what you have mentioned, innovation, creativity, and talents, it, it's along with like soft power. And I was wondering, what are some sports done in culture aspects in your country, UK, to trying to encourage the society to have more soft power? Um, I'm not sure that there's been a conscious effort uh, in the UK, or at least there is now, but in the past I'm not sure that there's been a conscious effort to uh, develop our soft power and leverage our soft power, if you like. Um, but we have, uh, we have the, we're fortunate in that English is the global language, which gives us a natural um, advantage. Uh, but the, uh, I think we have I mean, we've gone through some tough times in the United Kingdom, but there's a resilience in British society that, that breeds a confidence and a sense, that, a sense among people that you can achieve things if you really set your mind to it. And I think now, particularly in a city like London, there's a, a, it's a fantastic environment in which anybody with a good idea can make that idea flourish. Um, and through things like the BBC, through... Uh, really globally respected publications that have nothing to do with government like the Financial Times uh, or The Economist um, through the work of an organization like the British Council we're able to showcase the very best of British talent but also showcase British values what we think of as British values and often they're values that are shared by other countries around the world like here in Korea um, uh, and I think it's you know, the combination of uh, those strong organisations, strong institutions, and the, uh, again, I come back to this point about openness uh, that enables you to, uh, to develop that sense, of, that sense of soft power. But it has to be, soft power has to be grounded in people's perceptions of how a country really is. Um, and so we're only... We can only be convincing if people in Korea or in other countries around the world actually have the impression that what we're saying about Britain, what I'm saying about Britain in terms of innovation or creativity um, or uh, education, only if you believe that there's some truth in that, um, is that soft power real? Um, thank you for your presentation. So Britain has... Well, I do believe there are many things to be proud of. Uh, it does have an Im extensive imperial history as well. And I was wondering if um, Britain's history of imperialism in any way affects uh, the way um, minorities are treated in Britain and whether um, having that kind of uh, history negatively influences relations with countries, particularly in like Southeast Asia and South Asia. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, it's very important that, you should be con that a country should be conscious of its history and its, uh, its past if it's going to understand the perspective of its international partners in the modern era. Uh, and on your second point, I think uh, we have to be, in the United Kingdom, it's important that we're sensitive and understand uh, that in the 19th century in particular, in places like China, uh, uh, the you know our historical record isn't a glorious one. Uh, I think the uh, uh, the reaction and the feelings of Chinese people towards the United Kingdom now are shaped by the way in which the United Kingdom acted in China in the in the nineteenth century. Um, it's also important, for example, in our relationship with India. Uh, that, that we are sensitive to, uh, to uh, our, our legacy and our, our imperial history, also in parts of sub-Saharan Africa. Um, as to the position of uh, minority ethnic communities in the United Kingdom, um, uh, it's not straightforward. Uh, the, uh, I would say the situation 20 or 30 years ago was poor uh, in terms of race relations. Uh, but I think there's been quite a lot of progress um, made since then um, and uh, London now is hugely ethnically diverse uh, and 
now I don't think, I don't sense tension in a city like London in, uh, in terms of uh, relationships between different communities. And there's a lot of mixing between different communities now. And, and that's one of the, the sources of this great creativity, I think, that you find in the United Kingdom. Um, I think in poorer parts of the UK, where there are substantial um, minority ethnic community, communities, you do see more tension between, uh, between different communities. And that, I think, is a continuing and existing challenge for um, our politicians and for business leaders uh, and, uh, and community leaders to overcome that and to make sure that we are uh, a really successfully integrated society right across the United Kingdom. Any other questions? Well, if not, thank you very much for, thank you for some great questions. Uh, and thank you for listening. It's been a real pleasure to have this opportunity to introduce one or two different aspects of uh, contemporary British society. Thank you very much.